Denham, a prosperous Buckinghamshire town in the North London commuter belt. The town is rocked by a violent event. Such attacks on, on, on a woman in broad daylight in a respectable part of London uh, are, are, are extremely rare. That's what makes it so shocking. For somebody to do that, and in the way in which they did it, and in the ferocity in which they did it, uh, would lead me to believe that there was an emotion behind that. It's early in June, and an attractive, successful businesswoman is leaving her home to drive into her London office. It was one of the most senseless, barbaric killings I've ever come across and ever reported on. My first thoughts were, what a waste, what a waste of a fantastic woman. Within hours, her body will be found, stabbed to death in the most brutal and frenzied manner. It's a crime which shocks and horrifies, and is one which remains unsolved. It's right up there in, in the worst murders that we've covered. Where do you just disappear to, covered in, in blood? A horrible, frenzied attack uh, of, of the worst possible kind. Murder is horrific, and any tragedy of such magnitude leaves a trail of devastation in its wake. It's all the more traumatic when the crime is unsolved and when there appears to be no obvious motive for the killing. This is one such case. It was a horrific murder. It happened in broad daylight. It's a very, should be a very solvable murder. I'm criminologist Donald McIntyre, and in this series, I've brought together an unrivaled team of specialist investigators. We'll work with the original detectives to bring to light new information and hopefully find some closure for the friends and family of some of the victims of some of the most shocking and impenetrable cold cases. On this programme, the vicious murder of Penny Bell, the Buckinghamshire businesswoman and mother inexplicably stabbed to death in the car park of a West London suburb. We trace her last movements, speak to her friends and relatives to try and understand the circumstances behind this terrible mystery. We'll re-examine the old evidence, speak to witnesses, collaborate with the key detectives to bring fresh impetus to the case to try and discover what happened to Penny Bell. The body of 43-year-old Penny Bell was found in the front seat of her car in Perryville, Greenford, West London, in June 1991. No one has been charged in connection with her murder. Now I'm hoping that my cold case team and I can do something to unravel the mystery which has surrounded this brutal killing for over two decades. I've spent some time with Penny's daughter, Lauren, and she, like so many other people who knew her mother, is keen that something happens to try to move this tragic case forward. I'm hoping that my cold case team can do just that. Clive Driscoll is a former detective chief inspector with Scotland Yard. He has had many noted investigations over the course of his 35-year career. He's seen many cases like this one and understands its complexity. In addition, we've enlisted the help of Elizabeth Yardley. Dr. Yardley is a criminologist and the director of the Centre for Applied Criminology at Birmingham City University. We know that she said she was running late for a meeting because she told one of the builders. We know that people have seen her and we can place her in a car with, with a man. 
It's the timing which is more significant for me. There's 30 minutes of time, and it's what happened during those 30 minutes. To commit a crime like this, it has to be of a very personal nature, it seemed to me. Penny and her husband Alistair, their two children, Tim and Lauren, lived here in this salubrious development in Baker's Wood near Uxbridge, just outside of London. They had a close-knit family and lived a pretty affluent lifestyle. We lived in Denham in Buckinghamshire, which uh, at the time was a very beautiful um, rural suburb of, of London. It's a very moneyed place, the houses are huge, the schools are fantastic. You know, it's kind of one of those places that sort of everyone would perhaps aspire to live in one day. Quite an expensive retreat uh, away from London, but you can get into London fairly quickly. Very easy for her to commute in and very easy for us to have that kind of lovely country style lifetime at the weekend. Scylla Black lived within five miles or something like that, which made her a near neighbour immediately. It's a safe haven for rich people who don't, didn't want to live in London. My brother and I definitely received, um, a, a, yes, a more so privileged upbringing than, than most, and certainly than what my parents did. They had worked extremely hard to enable us to have that kind of a childhood. Vicky Bird was the Bell family nanny at the time of Penny's death. She remembers her as a kind and considerate person. I only knew her for a very short amount of time, but had a huge impact on my life being part of her family, even though she's not here. Um, but she was, you know, she was a fantastic lady. She was bright, smart, funny, loving, generous. We went out on day trips, and uh, I even went, took the children away to the, the family caravan for a holiday. Um, so, yeah, we did, you know, we had lots of fun. Penny also found time to devote to charitable causes and was very active in this part of her life. She had previously worked for the Samaritans in their concert division, so did she'd been to all the big concerts throughout the United Kingdom, trying to help people who were less fortunate, trying to talk to people out of committing suicide who possibly were thinking about that. She was generous with her time and she was generous with her feelings. There's no doubt, though, Penny's hard work was, in a sense, making up for her own difficult upbringing. She was adopted. She didn't have a very happy childhood, and I think she went off to boarding school. So I think from her own perspective, having started life very much on her own and quite lonely and uh, with not an awful lot, I think that's exactly what she wanted to go out and achieve for herself. She left home fairly quickly as soon as she could, and the profiles of at the time suggested that she was looking for stability and to settle down and uh, you know, to have a nice stable base for her and her children. Penny was a successful businesswoman and had built up a fine business in recruitment. By all accounts, she was a very good person to do business with. It was my mum that went out to work. She had her own company, uh, Cover Staff, which was a recruitment agency, which she built up from nothing, and it was extremely successful. So it just worked out at that time that my dad would stay home and she would go to work. Penny's work was, I think, difficult and hard and maybe long hours, but she was able to look after Alistair and the kids. She was the main breadwinner in the family. Alistair would do some work, but she was the main breadwinner there, so she looked after, after them all, and Alistair, I think, probably looked after the kids. In contrast to her exceptionally busy life, working, being a, a you know, very hard-working mum, she was always the person that was there for friends, family, whatever needed it. It was someone who lit up the room when you saw her. So it was exciting, it was great to see her and Alistair together, to know, to know you were gonna spend some time with them was a great thing to do. Gregarious, outgoing, friendly, had a contented and settled life. From the outside, Penny appeared to have it all, an attractive family, a great house, and a thriving business. What then could possibly have happened in her life that could have led to her murder? Liz, what's your overall sense of this case? This was a very successful woman who'd, who'd come from a, a background that was, was constraining her, essentially, in her early years, but she fought against that. She was real, a real success symbol, basically, of this decade. And the fact that it's still unsolved so many years on, and there are so many little pieces of the puzzle, but we haven't quite managed to put it together yet. 
She kind of broke those gender lines as a really strong businesswoman. Do you think that that might have, uh, might have attracted some danger to her, particularly in as regards to the situation? Well, it definitely would have made her stand out at the time, the late 80s, the early 90s. We're, we're in a very different era now and successful business women are you know, all around us. But back then, it, it wasn't quite the same. So she would have stood out. She would have attracted attention, perhaps the wrong kind of attention. Clive, what's your sense of this case? I think that the, the circumstance of her last moments, which, we, to say the very least, were, were traumatic, was that this was a, quite a concerted attack. So, on first look, it's clear that Penny was a normal, helpful, friendly person. She liked to show off her success, but not in an ostentatious way. But was there some secret which not even her closest friends and family knew about? Or did life just take some unfortunate turn which would lead to her death? Coming up, the events on the fateful day Penny Bell was murdered and questions surrounding a meeting she had that morning which has perplexed everyone involved in the case since. Businesswoman Penny Bell was brutally murdered in her car on a June Thursday. There has never been any explanation or apparent motive for the attack and over two decades later, no one has ever been charged. I'm hoping that my cold case team will go some way to unravelling this perplexing case and perhaps aid investigators in looking at this crime in a whole new perspective. I've been to the area where Penny lived. I've also visited and chatted to her daughter Lauren and other people who knew her. They all remember her as a considerate, loving and devoted mother and friend. No one can come up with any reason for her murder. On the morning of her death, Penny Bell left her home here in Baker's Wood. She had builders in the house and told them she was running late and was clearly anxious to leave. She was the one that they would go to. My dad was, was very often out. He was off doing a school run very early, so my mum happened to be uh, the main person that they would sort of talk to, and, and she would run everything that was going on, down to sort of paying the builders and, you know, geeing them up when things got a little bit slow. We had... I think 20 builders on site at the time, so you know people coming and going at all times, so it seemed like a bit of a madhouse. There were builders in the house, so there were other people in the house, so it's possibly, I mean, we've all, you know, I've had building work done, it is slightly more frenetic than normal, so there's probably a lot of to and fro -ing. The main builder wanted to have a conversation with her, uh, and it sort of waited for her to appear, and when he did, um, very out of character, she just sort of said, I have to go, I have a meeting that I need to get to. And, uh, and, you know, she just said, You're, it, whatever it is, we'll have to wait, and left. And so I think even he recalled it being out of character for her. There was nothing in her, the way she said it, that was any cause for alarm. It was obviously, she was going, it, it sounded like she was going to meet a client, um, but she left the house as normal. But her behaviour the night before is remembered by some as being anything but normal. My dad recalls her being very, um, she was sort of lost in her own thoughts and, and not, in a, not in a great place. And understandably, the builder then, similarly the next day, echoed that and said that she was just, she was sort of zoned out, she was somewhere else. So she obviously knew something was, was going on. She was running late for a meeting which she didn't record in any diary and we know that she said she was running late for a meeting because she told one of the builders. Uh, this meeting which was to result in, 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 in the end of her life, in her death, the fact that she wasn't recorded anywhere, that nobody knew who she was meeting, it was a slightly unusual time. What was going on there, Liz, do you think? I'd like to look at what was normal for her. Was it normal for her to document all of her appointments? Would, would she make an appointment at short notice and perhaps not note it down? So I'd need to know what would she do regularly and, and does this stand out as odd? But I've discovered in talking to Lauren that Penny wrote all of her appointments in her diary. Curiously, though, there was nothing written down for that morning. We now know that Penny was behaving somewhat out of character. A little zoned out, as Lauren describes it, but there was nothing in her behaviour to indicate in any way what would happen next. At around 10 o'clock in the morning, witnesses said that they saw Penny's car driving along this road, the Greenford Road. Witnesses said that they saw her distinctive Jaguar car with its hazard lights on and apparently a man in the passenger seat. 
as she drove down this road, witnesses reported that she had her hazard lights on and was clearly in distress. One person said they thought she was mouthing help. It's just so distressing to imagine the terror that must have enveloped her as she drove to her demise into this car park here. They actually saw her car travelling down a very, very busy road into London, which at that time would have been you know, at its busiest. She was apparently doing 15 miles an hour with her hazard lights flashing and the windscreen wipers going. I mean, it was the 6th of June, so it's a summer day, in the days where we did actually have a summer in June. So it would have even more, um, it would have stuck out very much so, given the circumstances. No one did anything. No one stopped. I mean, it, you know, to be driving at 10 miles an hour in that area is, is unusual. And um, so that was sort of like the last sighting until her car was found in the car park of the sports centre. It's then believed she drove here, into the car park of the Gurnall Grove Leisure Centre at around 10.30 a.m. Whatever else she might have intended to do that morning, it's generally accepted that this wasn't the normal sort of place she would conduct a meeting. The attack took place in this car park. The police said that her assailant stabbed and slashed at her from the passenger seat with his right hand. He also got out and attacked her from the driver's side. She never stood a chance. Penny's body was found at around midday by two women returning to their car. She was slumped over the steering wheel with blood all over her clothes. Standing here in the Gurnell Leisure Centre car park with all these people and these cars about, it's hard to believe how a perpetrator with blood in his hands and all over him could simply disappear unnoticed from the scene of the crime. He would have been covered in blood, but he got out of the car in broad daylight, walked around to her side of the car, opened the driver's door and continued his attack uh, on her back. There would have been children around, parents around. Um, it, it is, albeit the area is a swimming pool, the area itself is, is highly um, populated and, and would have had lots of through traffic and, and everything else. Where do you just disappear to, covered in, in blood? Time-wise, that would have been 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, unless they sat there for some time before the murder took place, obviously there's potential for that. But under the circumstances, I think that the murderer would have left blood-stained around about 10.30, 11 o'clock and probably walked through the car park. Um, from the information that we've got, it, it seems that Penny drove him there, or the person who had committed the murder there. So they would have had to leave by foot, unless they already had a car left there to drive away in. You can imagine that the blood, it comes out of the body, the major arteries would have been severed, she, it would have been all over the place. Even the mere act of getting out of the car would have spread the blood around. There was a lot of blood. Um, so that person must have, have I mean, very quickly got into some kind of cover, perhaps got into another car and drove away, certainly would have needed to discard their clothes very quickly, would have needed to clean up, would have needed to discard the murder weapon. None of this has ever been found. Um, so it does imply someone who either had incredibly careful planning or was just very fortunate to be able to get away. The emergency services, the police and the ambulances arrive within minutes, but despite all the medical attention, it was very evident that Penny Bell was dead and her killer had vanished. What do we know that we can think maybe help us try and solve this in terms of that, that morning? We know that, that she left home. Um, we know that she set off on the route to the meeting. Um, whether the meeting was this, this encounter that she had with this individual or whether she was on the way to that meeting, we know she was on, on her way out, so we know that she, she left, left the house. We know that people have seen her and we can place her in a car with, with a man. Um, but, but beyond that, there, there are no witnesses to the actual attack itself. We just know that it took place. We know there are no witnesses who have come forward to the attack. What's interesting about this, Clive, and you've, uh, you've focused on this, is that there are 
there's some discrepancy in the, uh, there are a number of discrepancies in the identification of the passenger who was with her, the person who was with her in the car, but there is no discrepancy in terms of the sense that here was a woman who was uh, clearly in distress, hazard lights on, asking for help, and yet no one actually came to her assistance. Why was that? Well, I think that's more of an indictment on our society, actually, than on Penny. I think Penny did everything she could to, uh, you know, maybe to alert people to the, the, the situation she was in. For the police, the murder presented them with an unusual case, a murder of a respectable woman in her car in the middle of the morning. But for Penny Belt's family, the events of the previous couple of hours were about to become momentous and life-changing. I was at school and nobody came to collect me that day. So I was the last child outside of the gates. I remember running up this person's driveway and running as fast as I could into hours. And I, as I turned the corner, I could see my dad. He was at the door and he was on his knees. And um, I ran to him and I just said, What's happened to Mum? It's very clear to me that all of what happened to Penny revolves around the meeting she was rushing off to on the morning of her death. But there's no real information about the meeting. But the person who killed Penny clearly tried to make the police think he met her for legitimate reasons. Coming up, how our killer used decorative samples to try and prove this and unusual patterns in her behaviour in the days leading up to her death. The body of businesswoman Penny Bell was found slumped over the steering wheel of her Jaguar in a car park in Perryvale, northwest London, one Thursday morning in June 1991. She'd been brutally stabbed by a man sitting in the passenger seat beside her. I've been working with my cold case team to re-examine the circumstances surrounding the murder of Penny Bell. Having reviewed the files and having spoken to those who knew her, it appears that she'd no enemies to speak of. I've also spent time with Penny's family and friends. Her daughter Lauren in particular remembers the horror of discovering that her mother had been murdered. Her father had the heartbreaking task of telling her what happened. By this time it was already on the news, we were sat in front of a television watching it, and he said that there was, that Mum's car had been found and that there was somebody in it, and that person wasn't very well. But we didn't know if it was Mum, so we had to, we had to hope and pray all night that it wasn't her and that she, you know, something else had happened and she would come back. And the next day on the Friday, he left, he was picked up by police and he had to go and identify the person that they had found. And uh, I remember him coming home and again, seeing my six foot two dad, who had always been this sort of pillar of strength, once again reduced to his knees, telling me that it was mum. The police investigation, which was rapidly underway, involved a number of forces and a great deal of activity. There were like 2,500 people were interviewed, there were 8,000 witness statements. I mean, it was on a massive scale. And, and yet, it, it just seemed to flounder. The police turned their lives absolutely upside down. I mean, nothing, no stone was left unturned. If she'd been having an affair or booking into hotels, or, or was ending an affair, they would have found out. And it went on because the police were being incredibly cooperative. And our crime guys, I think uh, Jeff Garvey is dead now, but he was, he was extraordinarily well connected at the yard and he was getting a lot of stuff on it, and so, and which the police were obviously happy for him to do because it was very much a, in solving the crime, they very much appeared, appeared to need witnesses. Uh, and so appealing to the public and that sort of thing. But they had, after, after a while, you've got to do that a little more cleverly than just saying we appeal for help because pe people are bored of that. So they were proactive for quite a long time. It's clear to me, though, that some of the things she might have done in the days and weeks prior to her murder might have attracted the wrong sort of attention. 
We know that Penny withdrew eight and a half thousand pounds in the days before she was murdered. That's only 17,000 pounds in today's money. Could this be in any which way connected with her death? Perhaps she was being blackmailed or was she in financial difficulty that her family didn't know anything about? She had withdrawn the cash a couple of days before, um, but hadn't told her husband that she had done so, and it came from a joint account. So the, the, the money only came to light so as the police started looking into the, into the case. Um, and then Lauren was able to confirm that she had seen a bundle of cash in, sort of stuck in the top of her mother's bag on the day that Penny was going off to meet this person. So is there a possibility that the money she took from the bank might have been needed for a sinister purpose? Because she hadn't told Alistair that she was withdrawing the money and it wasn't for the building work that was going on in the house, that perhaps she was using it to pay someone that she didn't want Alistair to know about, therefore she was keeping it a secret. It could be blackmail, um, which obviously the investigative team looked at very carefully as well. So it, it was a very, very important line of inquiry. And unfortunately, um, at this moment in time, it hasn't led anywhere. If you kind of break this down into her, the days leading up to it, of course, one of the key things is that she extracted eight and a half thousand pounds from a bank. We don't know where that money is. We don't know why she withdrew it. Do you think this is in any which way connected? It could be. We need to become familiar with what was normal for her. Um, this was back in the, the early 90s where people used cash more. There was building work going on in the house. How was that being paid for? So we need to look at how regularly was this woman using large amounts of money. It might have been unusual, but then again, it might not. If you draw in 8,500 within your business, then there's usually a paper trail. It's the timing which is more significant for me. There's 30 minutes of time, and it's what happened during those 30 minutes, I think, are significant. Do you think that was a, potentially a motive for murder, just that sum of money at the time, it's kind of worth nearly double, in say, in today's money? Well, people have murdered for a lot less than that, so it would definitely be on my list of, of things that could be significant. It wasn't uncommon for her to be drawing out large amounts of cash. Um, some would say that, you know, carrying it around in your handbag was slightly silly, but uh, she was a very trusting and sort of laid back kind of lady. So um, in that respect, I think she would have felt totally at ease with it. But yes, so the actual drawing out of money was not uncommon and it was drawn out from a, a joint account. So there was no hiding that. Yeah, that money was, was visible, that transaction was, was known about, even to my dad. But is there another, more simple explanation for the confrontation in the car park that morning? There is, of course, the possibility that this was a robbery gone wrong. Now, while we have to factor in such theories, for me, it simply doesn't hold water and can't explain the ferocity and visceral nature of the attack. By the fact he was in a compressed space means he couldn't get an initial killing strike on her and had to do it lots of times. But I think the stabbing was cons lots of cuts on her arms. I think it was consistent with her fighting him off and him just carrying on and on and on. I don't think that this was um, an aim at any particular organ or any part of the body to, as a killing blow. It was a frenzied attack when there's multiple blows, over 50 of them. So it would, would have been, um, I would think, quite fast and furious. My mum was renowned for having beautiful, long nails. And I just remember the police. I overheard them telling my dad that she had none left, that she had fought for her life. Um, and in such a small car as well, the cabin of that car is, is very intimate. And I know that she would have fought, uh, yeah, in, in such a way that it would have been, it it would have been ferocious. And there's something else about the event in the car that indicates that this wasn't a random event. The killer appears to have tried to cover his tracks by doing something which might suggest that his initial interaction with Penny that morning was a straightforward business meeting. On the dashboard was laid out wallpaper samples, um, samples for our, our cupboard doors that we were looking at, so all things that she would have had on her, but laid out in such a way that it would look as though she was showing that to somebody. Whether that was... Um, put there afterwards or put there before, I don't know. 
everything I've heard makes me more convinced than ever that Penny's killer wasn't a stranger. If he was just out to rob her money, or even to blackmail her, why would he strike her with such ferocity? I'm sure the police have always thought the same. So what was the motive? If you want to try and eliminate kind of theft and that eight and a half thousand pounds as the prime uh, uh, engine behind the murder, do you think that was a reasonable supposition considering, you know, a frenzied attack? Yeah, I mean, given the, the nature of the frenzied attack, um, it, it went on, as we know, for, for quite a while. If you are trying to get to the money, um, you, you can threaten somebody to, to hand it over and, and then perhaps you, you would attack them, you know, a couple of times. But, but the, the real, it's the term overkill, way much more violence than was needed to end somebody's life. So, so what was all that about? So perhaps the money wasn't the prime engine in this uh, murder, but it may have been in the mix, Clive. If you're asking me about the money, I would probably be leaning towards blackmail more than robbery, but, but I do believe that the, that the fact that she knew something was wrong, she mouthed help, it's very significant that she knew that the situation she was in wasn't going to plan and was going, was going badly wrong is significant. Coming up, a revelation about Penny's husband becomes an unwarranted and spurious focus of the investigation. And I reveal my conclusions about what really happened to Penny Bell. Businesswoman Penny Bell was brutally stabbed in a car park in Perryvale, northwest London, one Thursday morning in 1991. She left her home saying she had an appointment. The person she was meeting, or the circumstances surrounding it, still remain a mystery. I've been examining the murder with my cold case team, and it's clear to me that this tragic and disturbing investigation has a number of complex issues around it, which have caused a number of difficulties for detectives over the years. Just days into the investigation, a revelation emerged which became the focus of the media, possibly to the detriment of the case and the search for Penny Bell's killer. The papers began to report on what they called Penny's tangled love life. The specifics, though, referred to her husband's gay affairs. The whole story became tabloid fodder and proved to be hugely detrimental to the investigation. He's bisexual. Um, he'd met my mum when he was in a relationship with a man. My mum knew them both very well. They were all great friends. Um, and the police quizzed him about this intently. They were absolutely you know, sure in the beginning stages that this must have been some kind of lover's tryst. They gave him a very hard interview indeed, um, as long as they could, and, and by all accounts, pretty aggressive. Initially, he was obviously the main suspect. He was cleared but not after the, the, the fact of his past had been in the papers, um, in, which was, I, I think, a fairly deliberate leak at the time. Every investigation into somebody's murder, you start looking as close as possible to who may be involved and why they might be involved. Alistair's relationship with Penny may, well, certainly did give reason to suspect him at that moment in time, and he was questioned extensively by the initial investigation team um, and subsequently ruled out of the investigation. So it did have an impact upon the investigation. It didn't have um, a major detrimental effect because every investigation, you've got to look at every lead and treat every person of interest as such. But like me, most observers believe the decision to release the information about Alistair's private life was counterproductive. It was absolutely irrelevant. If at any point I thought Alistair may have been involved in this, then I, I, was, I would say something. At no point have I thought Alistair was involved. He was a loving husband who got very, very well with his wife. He wasn't the person. He wasn't the person who would go and do this to his wife. It was someone else. It didn't happen from within the family. When they released the details of Alistair's past, it kind of, it, it really put such a, a sort of darkness on their marriage that actually wasn't there. Everyone who knows them said they were, they, they absolutely adored each other. They were in love and it didn't matter, you know, we all, everyone has, you know, relationships in the past. It had no bearing on their marriage. They were really, really happy. The story took away from the actual, what it should have been about. But that was beyond the control of Alistair. There's nothing Alistair could have done about that. And Alistair did the best by his children as he could in those circumstances. It would have been very, very difficult for him. Not only was he 
not only is his wife being horrendously murdered, but now the press are kind of tur turning the camera on him, and that's, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Perhaps it didn't help in this case, because they would waste time and resources going for something that actually uh, was, was not relevant to it. But while there was nothing in Alistair's personal life other than the information which caused such a distracting sideshow, I've begun to wonder if it was something in Penny's own private life which might have led to difficulties for her and ultimately to her death. Is it possible that the meeting she drove to was of a personal nature? Is it conceivable that the person who stabbed her was romantically involved with Penny Bell? What else could explain the personal, ferocious nature of the attack? For somebody to do that, and in the way in which they did it, and in the ferocity in which they did it, uh, would lead me to believe that there was an emotion behind that, a crime of passion, which I know is what it has been referred to before, which I believe, I believe there was either some kind of love or hatred there, or both, which led to that. I believe wholeheartedly that there was nothing untoward happening, and I, I think the police believe that as well. The minutes in her day are accounted for every day. I don't believe that there was any affair going on, and the way in which she died, there was no um, sexual interferences or anything of that nature. I think that there could have been some bribery, something like that. Obviously, there was money then that went missing, and I think that... Uh, yeah, I think that this person knew my mum, knew that she um, was wealthy and, and possibly could have had some money that, 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 that may have been the reason. I mean, again, that really is a guess, but I think, I think that's what it leads to. Lauren has validated my view that Penny knew her killer. As she says, some kind of love or hatred her view that the murder was in some way financially connected also stacks up with all of the evidence we've seen, and my cold case team appeared to concur. To your area of expertise, the kind of pathology and psychology of the killer, to commit a crime like this, it has to be of a very personal nature, it seemed to me. I'd say so, absolutely. Um, the ferocity of the attack, um, the, the use of, of violence, and way more violence than you needed to end someone's life, it would suggest that there was you know, some kind of personal motive, whether that personal motive had come from that encounter then, whether it was something that had been building up over time. It's, it's a really, really horrendous attack. Uh I think if you're going to kind of look for likelihoods here, you can probably eliminate stranger danger. I mean, would you suggest that it's most likely she knew her killer? I would say so, yes, because most people who are murdered are killed by somebody they know. And when we look at women who are killed, it's most often a partner, an ex-partner, somebody they've been romantically involved with. Um, so, so the idea that this would be a stranger, I'm not sure. In the course of this re-examination of the evidence surrounding this case, Journalist Michelle Davies has brought some new information to our attention. It's something I believe could really be relevant, and it suggests that someone other than the killer knows who murdered Penny in the car park that morning. Michelle interviewed Lauren in the course of researching an article on Penny's murder. When I interviewed her and the story appeared online of the newspaper, I was, a couple of days after it was published, I was reading the comments below, and someone had actually put a comment on there asking me to get in touch with Lauren because they said they knew what had happened. But there was something about this comment that I, I emailed it to Lauren and said, I think the police need to check this out. Um, and they said that they knew who, who did it and said, I'm so very sorry, as if they knew. And, and there was that the, they were involved. And I know the police looked into it, and I don't think they could trace who actually left that comment. Someone out there is leaving comments on, the, on stories about Lauren and saying that they know who it is, um, and they need to come forward. Because they, if they're protecting that person, the time's, it's time to stop. It's time to stop protecting them. So who is this person? It seems unlikely to me that after so many years that someone would take the time to write a message of that sort if they didn't actually know something. Someone has clearly been following the case all of this time and is living with a dreadful secret.
Having reviewed all the evidence, I believe that Penny Bell sensed that danger was lurking around the corner. When she left her house, she told no one of her ultimate destination. I believe that she understood the person she was going to meet that day was not well-intentioned, perhaps was criminally motivated. The ferocity of the attack tells me that she must have known her attacker. The vast majority of murders are committed by somebody that, or the victim knows the, the, the perpetrator. Um, particularly in cases of female victims where it's, the statistic varies slightly, but it's normally around sort of two thirds or three quarters are known to, to, to their killer. And with men, it's about half the percentage. So stranger murders are relatively rare. In fact, they're very rare. The circumstances of Penny Bell's murder would make me believe that the person who killed her was known to her. I think it's, um, I don't believe that the person sitting in the passenger seat of her car was not known to her before the crime took place. I think she knew that something, something out of the ordinary was happening that morning. I think she knew who she was meeting. And I think she was anxious about the, the outcome or, or what, was, what was to happen. What that is, I honestly don't know. Who it was, I, I have a feeling as to who it might have been, uh, but I don't know. But I think there was something that was uh, pressing her that day that she obviously thought she could handle, and hence the fact uh, didn't tell anyone about it. But I think she knew who she was meeting that day. I believe that this was a crime of passion. This was an unrequited passion, a love that only went one way. The attacker knew her and wanted Penny. And when he didn't get the answers he wanted, he struck and he struck again. I believe the answers rest with those who are close to her and that the police must follow up some old leads.